I am Dr. Ebenezer Nikoi, uh, and I would be uh, taking you through session three of the introduction to uh, human geography. Uh, the previous two sessions have been uh, handled by Dr. Isaac Arthur. For this session, our purpose is to understand human societies. We want to be able to tell uh, what the dynamics of the interaction uh, between human beings and the environment in which they find themselves. And all the changes that we, you know, do to the environment so that we can feel comfortable in that environment. Um, at the next session, we'll be looking at, you know, uh, some of the uh, interesting dynamics in terms of the actual things that we do to the environment to change it. Uh, and then uh, we'll go ahead to also look at how the environment impacts us. Uh, but, you know, to start off, uh, we want to first understand what is the environment, because we can treat any of the two things, what the interaction is, without first knowing what the environment is. So uh, the objective for this session in particular uh, is to explain the concept of the environment. If we say the environment, what do we mean by it? Uh, we want to also describe the various components of it, uh, explain uh, environmental changes over time. You know, the environment has not remained the same from you know, the beginning of time. It has changed with time. And so we want to see what these changes are. And then we'll finally describe uh, human uh, societies and how they have adapted to the environment over the course of all these changes. Uh, the book that we would, uh, you know, I will refer you to, which will have a lot of information on everything that I will be discussing in this session, uh, is uh, Gettys and Gettys, uh, uh, Gettys, Gettys and Fellman, uh, 2006, Introduction to Geography. Uh, I don't want you reading the whole thing, uh, just focus on chapter 12, uh, pages 393 to 398. Um, <laughs> the practice has been for students not to read, you know. Uh, we don't refer the, to these uh, materials for the fun of it. Uh, a lot of the questions uh, that we would uh, be asking in uh, this uh, course uh, will be drawn from these pages. So reading them is very essential uh, for, you know, performing well in the class. Uh, the key topics, um, as I mentioned earlier for, for this session, will be concepts of the environment, um, the dynamics of human adaptation uh, to this environment, and then we would summarize. So just three things. We'll be out here in the, <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> um, so what we mean by the concept of the environment? You know, uh, usually when we talk about the environment, uh, we mean everything around us. You know, traditionally, people have talked about the environment just focusing on the physical aspects, you know, and I think you did uh, physical geography earlier on. Um, uh, this is the human component of that. Um, so I just want you to understand that even though you've come out of a physical geography class, when we talk about the environment, we don't just mean the physical aspects of it. Uh, we also mean you know, the communities in which we live, the places we work, where we eat, you know, the marketplaces, you know, the government buildings, you know, everything that is surrounds us, uh, living and non-living, uh, will come together to make up uh, this concept of environment and um, are there any examples of the environment that you can talk about uh, we can talk sometimes about rural environment urban environment home environment okay so the the term is not static you know there are various aspects of it see when i say uh you know the environment is everything around us it can get confusing sometimes in terms of trying to understand it. 
And so for us geographers, one of the ways we try to get around this is to break it up. Okay, so the environment is everything. And now we can break it up into two, uh, make it much simpler to describe the environment by talking about the physical environment, which is what you probably did um, last semester, and the human environment. And these are examples of the different types of environments. The physical, we have the atmosphere, hydrosphere, lithosphere, and the biosphere. Uh, we will go on in the subsequent slides to, you know, uh, go into details about what these individual components are. Uh, the human environment will be made up of the social, economic, political. Uh, you know, sometimes people will, you know, talk about a cultural environment. Um, I mean, sometimes you, you can talk about as many environments as you can think about. Uh, because as long as it's a set of things that surround you, that will make up your environment. Uh, we have already alluded, alluded to the fact that the environment is made up of the physical and human parts. Uh, we are going to focus on the physical in the next few slides. Um, so uh, when we talk about a physical environment, we are talking about the natural surroundings things like the land that we live on. Um, we are talking about the atmosphere around us. Um, we are also talking about the ecosystem, the interdependencies uh, that exist between these different aspects of the physical environment. Uh, the, the good thing about the physical, you know, doing any studies of the physical environment is that you can quantify it. You know, quantification is different from subjectification or subjectivity, you know, which means that subject means that, okay, what you are saying could be completely different from what I am saying. Uh, in terms of the physical environment, uh, we can quantify things in this realm so that we can talk about, let's say, the quantity of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, we can also talk about, you know, amount of land, land size. Okay, so it's easy to uh, usually, uh, you know, deal with the physicals. We can model things based on the physical because, you know, you don't have, you know, ifs and buts in there. It's all solid uh, numbers. So that is easy to uh, uh, model. Um, uh, some of these uh, physical environment is renewable. Um, you have vegetation that grows. Well, if you cut, it will grow up. Uh, not that sometimes after cutting it for so many times, you know, you would not completely, uh, you know, destroy that vegetation and maybe make it not grow again. But we can, you know, by and large, uh, differentiate between renewable uh, aspects of the physical environment uh, in terms of plants and animals uh, and non-renewable aspects uh, in, the, in terms of the minerals, uh, oil. So, you know, we are digging oil today in Ghana. Uh, that is non-renewable. Once we have dug it all out, we are out of it. Uh, the best chance we'll have is to find new sources. Um, but these are the two uh, differences that I want you to yeah. understand with reference to the physical environment. Um, so uh, going back into the individual uh, components, um, the atmosphere will be made up of uh, the gaseous uh, substances. Uh, and so carbon dioxide, oxygen, hydrogen, um, you know, nitrogen, these are all examples of it. Uh, the hydrosphere is made up of, you know, all the water bodies, okay? So the lakes, the streams, uh, the ocean, um, uh, these are, will comprise the, the hydrosphere. The lithosphere will be made up of the hard, solid earth, okay? Um, it's not just the surface of it, but it extends uh, further down, 
uh, a number of miles into the Earth's crust. Uh, and these are the, some of the places where we get our gold and all the other precious minerals. Um, uh, sometimes it will also contain aquifers, uh, or, you know, water stored in underground reservoirs. Um, now, when we talk about the biosphere, it's made up of you know, these three components, but also includes uh, the first three things that we have already mentioned. The biosphere is the living world, you know, so that would have all the gases that makes life possible. It will have the surface on which life moves, uh, and, you know, part of life is also found in water in terms of fishes and other uh, aquatic animals. Um, so um, these are the four components. If, if you don't remember anything at all about the physical environment, uh, these four things, at least you should have them on your fingertips. All right. So we highlighted uh, in the previous uh, session, the, the previous slide, uh, we highlighted the physical. Uh, we said the environment is everything surrounding us, and it's made up of the physical and the human. We talked about the physical. This part is about the human uh, aspect of the environment. Uh, and this is made up of uh, all the man-made uh, surroundings, or all, all the resources that have been created by man. Uh, so what would you uh, see as some examples of man-made resources or surroundings. Uh, we can talk about what? Buildings. Okay, we can talk about the road networks. Uh, we can talk about, you know, the airports, um, you know, mining activities. Okay, these are all part of the human environment. Uh, the man-made things are supposed to mediate the effects of the, the physical environment on man. Okay. So we will build houses uh, so that when it rains, okay, which is a physical thing, a man would feel comfortable uh, in their homes. Okay. We would make uh, you know, road networks so that we are not walking in the bush and risk the chance of being bitten by a snake or attacked by a lion. We want to move faster, so we'll create things like vehicles. Okay. These are all uh, part of the things that human beings made. Um, we have also uh, domesticated uh, you know, part of the natural environment to serve our purposes. You know, imagine going constantly every day to you know, uh, go and hunt for some food you know, for your chicken or you know, uh, your fish. Now we can have, you know, tilapia, you know, uh, uh, projects where we can get our tilapia without going to uh, uh, fish for these things. Um, also examples include uh, agricultural resources, the mining resources, uh, urbanization. These are all aspects of the uh, human environment. Uh, you know, unlike the physical environment, with the human environment, there isn't a whole lot of uh, predictability. You know, things are always in ebb and flow. And so um, the ability to model a lot of human uh, activities is limited. Now, ESHEST, uh, 19. 94, you know, has, you know, divided the human environment into these uh, three component parts. Uh, we have the sociocultural environment, uh, which will be uh, made up of all the customs, the traditions, you know, the manner in which human beings, you know, organized, you know, their society, the respect system, okay? You know, um, adults and children have different positions. Uh, even the interaction between male and female. Okay, these are all parts of the, uh, the the customs and norms, the value system. What do we value in our society the most? You know, in some cases, some people value funerals. You know, 
above anything else. Uh, so it's all part of, uh, of, uh, of the socio-cultural environment. Uh, when we talk about the economic environment, we are looking at uh, economic infrastructure, the marketplaces, you know, trade activities. Um, we are looking at road networks, um, hospitals, uh, labor resources. These are all uh, part of the economic environment. And in terms of the political, um, we are looking at you know, the ways in which human beings have made laws to govern uh, the affairs of uh, interaction between uh, each other. Uh, and so you can, it, it, this can range from you know, women's group organization to you know, uh, laws being made by parliament. Uh, it includes democratic uh, institutions, um, autocratic. We have gone through many coup d'etats over many periods of time. Um, it's all part of the political uh, environment. So the natural environment, um, if taken on its own, um, has a certain level of dynamism uh, that comes with it. It's not static. Um, and you know, uh, this operates through what we call the ecosystem. You know, the idea that nothing, you know, exists in, uh, by itself, separate from uh, everything else. So this intimate interaction between different component parts uh, in the natural environment is what we will consider as the ecosystem. Um, and it looks at how both uh, living and non-living things uh, interact with each other. Um, the living things in this example would include uh, vegetation, um, uh, uh, animals, uh, human beings, and the non-living things would include things like the air, water, and soil. So how these things interact in a complete system is what we will, will call the, the ecosystem. Now, there is something that links these things together. Uh, and that is what we call the energy flow. Okay? The ecosystem would not exist. The interactions, the connections would not exist without the flow of energy. And uh, that is an important concept that I would have you uh, keep in mind. Uh, the flow of energy is what keeps this ecosystem in place. Okay, so how does the flow of energy uh, uh, take place? Um, you know, one important source uh, for this energy. You know, we we have a, a light a light system here, which is emitting some energy. You know, we can also um, in order what other ways can we um, you know talk about energy in our society. I think we have hydroelectricity, which is a form of energy that powers our, you know, computers, laptops, and phones. Um, we also have, you know, the stoves and the ovens, you know, creating some energy. Um, but in the ecosystem, the most important energy is the uh, sun, the light source um, from the sun. And um, you have uh, the sun, you know, shining on uh, everybody, basically. But uh, there are some aspects of this uh, natural environment that are able to utilize the, the sun to make their own food and not depend on other uh, uh, members of this ecosystem. And so we will call, uh, call these... Uh, 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 this component part, which takes the direct energy from the sun and produces its own food out of it, uh, we will call that the, the producers. And it's usually made up of uh, green uh, plants. Okay. 
I believe that we all know the process by which these green plants transform this energy uh, to, to food for their consumption. It's called what? Photosynthesis. Okay. The plants will take in the sunlight and then uh, process it to produce carbohydrates and sugars uh, for their own growth. Now, so they are the, what we call the producers. Now, beyond the producers, we have primary consumers. Okay. These primary consumers uh, rely on the uh, producers for their food. And we will call them, because they are eating the green plants, we will call them herbivores, okay, because they are eating plants. Now, next higher up, even though this, this thing looks like uh, the, the reverse, uh, but next higher up in this uh, ecosystem are the secondary consumers. Uh, they feed on the herbivores and sometimes uh, on other carnivores. And then we have the uh, decomposers, which are made up of, of uh, fungus, uh, bacteria that break down, um, you know, dead matter uh, from the um, carnivores and the secondary consumers, so that in some ways we have the sun energy transmitted through all these uh, components back into the soil for the plants to you know, utilize it again in conjunction with the sunlight to start the whole process again. And so uh, basically what we, what we say by the ecosystem sustained by the food chain uh, means that you know, the sunlight which starts the process um, you know, gets transmitted through all these different stages through what I would call the eating uh, relationship that exists between these uh, different component parts. So basically, uh, this is what I have already alluded to in the previous uh, slide. Um, the producers uh, produce their food from the combination of carbon dioxide, uh, water, and then the sunlight. And then the herbivores eat, the primary consumers um, uh, eat the herbivores, and then the tertiary consumers eat the carnivores. Um, the composers, bacteria, fungus, uh, they break down uh, dead matter and plants, uh, and then bring it back into the soil. Um, and so uh, this is basically uh, another expression an important question from the discussion we've been having so far uh, would be for you to be able to explain, you know, how the natural environment operates through the ecosystem. Um, if you are paying attention to what I have said so far, this should be a very easy question for you to tackle. All right. Now, so we have talked so far about you know, what the environment is, the various component parts of it, the human, the physical, the, you know, how these are connected, the dynamism of the ecosystem and all that. Okay. The next uh, thing we want to look at is you know, adaptations of human society to this uh, physical environment that we have uh, talked about. So, you know, it's not clear at this point uh, whether there is any acceptable, <laughs> uh, believable story about where human beings uh, started off from. Uh, if you're a Christian, you would say, you know, God made all of us in the Garden of Eden, uh, for example. Uh, if you're an evolutionist, uh, then you would say we all came from a fish in the, or some amphibian in the, under the bottom of the sea, okay? Uh, but, you know, it is believed that uh, around about five million to two million years ago, you know, human societies uh, uh, began to develop. 
uh, in an era we call the Pleistocene. Um, so yeah, human beings are, are developed as uh, cultural beings uh, with the ability to you know, make society uh, you know, hunt for food um, and you know, make their societies work for them. And um, since that time, uh, human beings have gone through a number of uh, evolutions uh, from the Homo habilis, Homo sapien, to Homo sapien sapien, to what we know to be our present form today. Um, one fact that remains indisputable is that you know, human societies first developed uh, in, in Central Africa uh, and portions of uh, uh, Central Asia. So um, this, this is a, an interesting, funny picture of you know, the various uh, changes that human beings have gone through from using very simple implements uh, to organize their society, find food to eat, to now using very sophisticated ways of exploiting the environment and in the process um, getting diseased uh, out of it. What we know today is that uh, by uh, 1500, uh, these uh, groups of human beings have been set in place. And so we have these five major stocks, uh, the Mongoloid uh, consisting of Asians, basically, uh, living in uh, Eastern, Southeastern Asia, um, and then the Negroid, uh, consisting of mostly Africans, uh, you know, south of the Saharan. Um, and then the Caucasoid, uh, are mostly people uh, from Asia, uh, from Europe, and then the Aust Australoid. This, this word is so difficult to pronounce, Australoid. Uh, these are mostly from Australia. And then it's believed that the American Indians are, for, are of a different stock. Um, it, we would have to look into more details of that uh, later on. But these are the five groups of uh, uh, human stocks that have developed or concretized uh, about 1500. So in terms of the complexity of the society, you know, um, human beings have gone from a very simple society uh, doing just hunting, gathering, to a very complicated, sophisticated society uh, uh, called the machine civilization. And we are going to take each one of these in turn and examine them into more detail. So regarding the uh, hunter-gatherer -gather society, um, you know, these are mostly people that are primitive, um, survived basically from what their environment would make available to them. And so if they, you know, live in an area for a long time, exploit all the resources from this area, and it gets run out, then they have to move from that place and go and find a new place where they can exploit uh, for their survival. They lived mostly on wild plants and animals and made very simple uh, tools for, you know, exploiting uh, uh, these resources. Uh, mostly stones and wood were fashioned into weapons uh, for exploiting uh, uh, these, uh, the resources in their environment. Now, we don't have you know, many uh, societies live in this way today, uh, but it's believed that, you know, the Eskimos and the Indians in America would fit into this uh, kind of society. Uh, the Bushmen in Namibia, the Pygmies, um, we will consider them as falling into this category of human society, very low in terms of uh, their development and evolution. Um, now we still interact with these, uh, if you go to the United States, as sophisticated as the society is, they still have to deal with the, uh, 
the Indians, uh, native Indians. And so uh, we still have them around, but there aren't that many of these societies uh, anymore. Now, uh, the pastoral society is a natural evolution from the hunter-gatherer society. Now, if you are sensible enough and you live in a place where you know, resources are running out con uh, constantly, then very soon you begin to think, okay, how do I you know, uh, live not off of these uh, resources that are constantly running out, but in what other ways can I survive? And so moving from one place to another is one of the ways to survive. Uh, the pastoral society, uh, you know, are mostly found in grassland and desert environments, and they mostly do uh, herding of animals. Uh, most of their wealth is stored uh, in the animals that they, they own. Um, they will occasionally do hunter gathering as they move from one place to place, uh, one place to another. Uh, but that is not the focus of this society. They mostly raise their own animals and use the products from these animals uh, for things like clothing uh, and food. Uh, sometimes they will trade, you know, they will engage in barter, uh, trade some of their animals for, uh, with other societies to get some uh, other goods that they don't have. Um, but most of these societies are confined to you know, Africa uh, across the Sahara Desert, and also uh, Iran, um, the Russian text. Uh, these will uh, be examples of, uh, of this uh, kind of society. Now, given everything that is going on today, what we'll realize is that these people are constantly, um, you know, coming under threat you know, urbanization is happening, you know, uh, uh, people are spreading out, farmlands are, you know, dwindling. And so places for these people to, you know, move to are also be becoming more and more scarce. And so this is, a, I would say, an endangered kind of society, um, but they are still in existence in, in some of these uh, places. A natural progression from the pastoral uh, civilization is the simple agriculture uh, uh, civilization. And these are mostly found in uh, you know, places where water is available. Even if the environment is dry, water has to be available for this kind of society to survive. Um, they have mostly domesticated vegetables and plants. And um, because of this domestication, they are able to support a larger uh, population. Okay, if you have to derive, you go and kill a few animals, it takes so many days to find these animals and kill, uh, it's very hard to support a large uh, population on that. Uh, so uh, the domestication of animals and plants makes uh, this society a possibility. And uh, because plants and animals can be grown now, uh, people are free to do other things uh, like craft, uh, manship, and uh, engage in other kinds of jobs. Um, so where are some of the places that we can find these uh, uh, civilization? Um, uh, tropical rainforests, uh, Central America. Uh, these are some of the places where this kinds of uh, society uh, exists. And then there is the vegetable uh, civilization. You know, these civilizations have advanced beyond the simple domestication of plants and animals. Uh, it's mostly characterized by a, a society that has moved or advanced uh, in its agricultural output and it's now at the threshold of uh, uh, or early stages of manufacturing uh, activities. Um, uh, much of the population engages in, in agriculture, uh, and so there is low uh, per capita uh, output 
uh, from uh, this society, and that also affects the living standard or living conditions of this uh, uh, civilization because uh, people are not as affluent uh, from engaging in mostly agricultural activity with some manufacturing activity. Uh, it is believed that Ghana would fall under this uh, type of civilization. Uh, it used to be that 60% uh, of uh, Ghanaians were engaged in agriculture and uh, were also doing some, you know, manufacturing the canary in, um, there was this, this canary in, in Sawon, okay, that was engaged in some early stages of, you know, uh, but we also have some industries in, in Tema, um, and so to some extent, we uh, you know, engage in some manufacturing, but it's not to the levels of the much more advanced uh, societies. Um, now this picture is a typical example of a vegetable society. You have a lot of uh, agricultural farmlands, you know, occupying the landscape, um, but a lot more people engaged in this means that they are not producing uh, a lot per head. The next level, which is considered probably the highest level of uh, all the civilizations that we've uh, talked about, is the machine civilization, uh, mostly found in uh, much developed or advanced countries like the United States, uh, uh, Europe, um, and it's also characterized by higher production uh, and uh, consumption uh, activities. Um, there is also a high level of infrastructure uh, development. Their roads are bigger and wider. Uh, they have extensive rail systems um, and they also enjoy a higher standard of living. Now, some believe that uh, these societies are as, as advanced as they are because if you talk about uh, the Industrial Revolution, uh, these are the places where, you know, uh, it began. And so they were far ahead of everybody else in developing uh, these manufacturing activities and uh, improvement in infrastructure. Uh, Henry Ford uh, is believed to have been one of the pioneers in uh, the Industrial Revolution producing cars for, um, that is affordable uh, for the, the middle class. Okay, now the, what might come out of uh, looking at all these civilization is some idea that, you know, as societies progress from these uh, very simple uh, hunter-gathering uh, stages to the much more advanced societies, uh, the dependence of the society on the environment uh, declines. Um, that would be a fallacy because, uh, you know, remember that we said there is a lot more consumption uh, of energy in the much advanced societies. Now, if you look at the ecosystem and the fact that we all, you know, draw our resources from the environment, uh, then uh, probably what is happening with the machine civilization is that their dependence is even more because they are drawing more from the society, uh, from the environment to be able to uh, produce the higher standard of living uh, that they are enjoying. So it would not be true to say that the lower the civilization, the more dependent uh, that civilization is on the environment. Okay, so now these uh, different civilizations that we've talked about are not static. You know, they are constantly evolving, they are constantly adapting to the environment, and so, uh, it is possible that, you know, even this machine society 
which seems to be the final uh, kind of uh, uh, society, a uh, civilization in this evolution, would change uh, with time. Um, and uh, for example, we have uh, Ghana moving from, you know, recently uh, from a low, uh, from a, a developing uh, poor country into the middle uh, income, low middle income uh, status. So there is a high chance that we would advance into the uh, um, machine civilization in no time. Um, okay, so to summarize, um, what we have seen so far is exploiting the concept or trying to understand uh, what we mean by the environment. We said it's everything around us and to make it easy for us to describe uh, the environment, we break it down uh, be, uh, into the physical and the human environment and we have looked at the various components of these environments. Uh, we have also seen uh, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, human beings have evolved and their dependence on the environment has changed with time and it's still in the process of uh, changing uh, because of the different dynamics that exist from time to time. Um, so uh, I would end here uh, and um, I will see you back here for the next session. Thank you.